So in April this year, I visited Magnus Walker at his property deep in the arts district of Los Angeles. Uh, spent the morning with him, uh, predominantly there to talk about cars, his Porsche collection, which he's very, very famous for. He's also very well known as a modifier of old classic Porsche 911. So parts one, two and three of uh, my little series here, me and Magnus Walker, uh, is really about the kind of car thing. But as we got talking over that two hours in LA, I realised that he's got a very, very interesting business story indeed. A guy that rocked up in LA at the age of 19 off a bus from some uh, camp up in uh, the uh, the northern part of the United States, having landed just a few weeks previously from Sheffield in the UK, his hometown. Uh, and when he arrived in LA with a couple of hundred dollars in his pocket, um, he just hustled, basically, and ended up, uh, after selling hats and jeans at Venice Beach, with uh, ended up with this significant clothing brand uh, and also built a film location business of all things um, and those things obviously uh, fueled his passion his ability to buy lots and lots of cars I think about 40 cars in his collection at the last count but anyway this video part four in this series is really about his business journey because I have to say the guy is quite inspiring and, and actually portrays a story, a journey that almost comes across as being accidental, uh, a kind of accidental entrepreneur, if you will. So look, watch this, see what you think. This is kind of 15, 16, 17 minutes of me talking to Magnus Walker about business, his entrepreneurial journey, uh, and kind of how he got where he is. It's very interesting, I think, very inspiring. Uh, and he's kind of the epitome of the American dream, I think. So anyway, watch this, see what you think. Uh, let me know in the comments uh, if you think this is interesting and we should kind of do more of this kind of thing. Let me know. So um, tell us about the TED Talk. I had no idea what TED Talks were. I got approached by the people that do TED Talks in 2014 saying, hey, we saw your Urban Outlaw film. We think you'd be great for a TED Talk. I said, what's a TED Talk? They go, we'll send you a few examples. Generally, it's an entrepreneurial, motivational, self-help, intellectual type thing. Yeah, it's notable people, influencers that, yeah, are going to kind of make a difference to people in what they say, right? Yeah, I suppose you could put it that way, yeah. So 10 years ago, I'd never seen one. They said, why don't you come on down and do one? I go, okay, how bad can that be? So I went down to UCLA where I did mine. They said, you should come down the night before, day before, do a test rehearsal. I go, oh, I've told my story a million times. You know, I'm familiar with it. You know, born this year, did this, did that. They go, well... TED Talk's a little bit different. You only have 18 minutes to do it, and it's in front of a live audience. So I went down there on a Friday afternoon, and I'm doing the TED Talk on a Saturday. And I rambled on for 45 minutes telling my story. And they go, we suggest you go home and script it. So I get you, home at 5 I bet you've never done, right? Something I've never done. Mm. I get home 5 o'clock on a Friday night, and I'm doing the TED Talk Saturday at noon. I start writing out my life story, born Sheffield, 67. Before you know it, I'm struggling to tell my story because I can't work off a script. So I just said, fuck it, I'm going to wing it. <clears throat> I walked out there a little apprehensive because you've got to imagine I left school at 15 with two O-levels. And now I'm standing on stage at UCLA, world-renowned campus, live in front of a thousand people. Yeah. Now, I'd only done a little bit of filming prior to that. You've got to remember, Urban Outlaw came out about 18 months before my TED Talk. An urban outlaw, the greatest thing about Tamir Moscovici and his crew was I'd ramble on, as you know, and they'd found the little gem spigots, edit it down and make me look good. Yeah. So I was like feeling pretty comfortable. Because that was supposed to be like 10 minutes and it ended up being an hour or something. Is that, is that the story? No, the urban outlaw story is Tamir Moscovici was looking to make a three to five minute short YouTube documentary, a short. He flew down from Toronto on his frequent fly miles, shot over four days and made what became a short 32 minute award winning documentary that premiered at the London Raindance Film Festival in September of 2012. 10 times longer than you all intended. Yeah, so I <laughs> rambled on, he made this award-winning short 32 minute documentary. And the only reason I really reference that every single time is without that film, you wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be here. Because he told my story in a direct or pictorial way that that story making and filmmaking wasn't as prevalent 14 years ago, 12, 14 years ago, as it is today. You got to remember 2010, 2012, the environment was a little bit different. Yeah. So that put me on the map, which led to the TED Talk. Now, the TED Talk, which is the most viewed thing I've done up to this point, it's almost 10 million views. 
I would say 98% of the people that watched my TED talk, which is called Go With Your Gut Feeling, had no idea who I was and were not car people. But the relatable element from my TED talk is just do what you love, don't overthink it, don't try and please other people. And I've got so many emails from people and I run into people all over the world that tell me they saw my TED talk and were inspired to do a career change out of something. The, the common thing is I went down this road, my dad was a lawyer, a doctor, whatever. I went into that industry, I hated it. What I really wanted to do was make candles or be a surfer or distill yeah. bourbon. Because Magnus, you're the antithesis of what everybody's taught at college, university, business school, uh, by so-called business mentors that all say, have a plan, have a goal, and then a strategy to get to that goal. You're the opposite. You've just done what you want to do. You've kind of led, been led by your passion, and it looks like you've done okay, right? Yeah, I say this. So is, is there advice there? I don't know. Because how I'm not sure how you can give advice apart from just kind of just go with it, right? Well, I always say there's two different types of people. I left school at 15 with two O levels. My sister left school with 11 O levels, three A levels, went to Durham University, got a degree. She's book smart. I'm street smart. Most entrepreneurs that I've met in LA, which is the epicenter melting pot of people that are not from here, but become entrepreneurs and end up becoming successful is the passionate about what they do. Yeah. So people ask me all the time for certain advice. My daughter wants to be a fashion designer. What should she do? Follow your gut, do what makes you happy. Do what motivates you to put 12, 14, 16, 18 hours a day into your hobby. The thing that wakes you up at 2 a.m. in the morning. How am I going to figure out this idea? So the whole, if you do a job you love, you never work a day in your life. I mean, that, that's not just a cliche. You think that's true? It's true for me. I've never had a job, a professional corporate job in my life. But you never had a plan, right? You got off the plane 19 years old in LA? 15. Uh, bummed around on the doll, working construction labor at 16, 17, went back to do a bullshit Mickey Mouse City and Girls Leisure and Recreation one year course at a community college. In Sheffield? In Sheffield. That's how I found out about Camp America. I left Sheffield as a 19 year old in 1986, came to work on a summer camp with un underprivileged inner city kids in Detroit 38 years ago in 1986. So after 1986, when I moved to LA, 38 years ago at the age of 19 I've never had a job working for anyone so I bummed around I couch surfed and then I found something I was passionate about the three things that I've done that have continuity that I say are the the fiber of the fabric the thread of my fabric are fashion design which became a successful clothing company called series clothing real estate investment I own multiple pieces of property in a neighborhood that no one was interested in 25 years ago I'm playing around with Porsches. And the common thread is, it's three topics that I had no education in, but I had a lot of passion. And LA is the epicenter of a melting pot of the opportunity to do whatever you want to do. Actor, movie star, surfer, beach bum, whatever it is, there's an infrastructure that's going to support you in doing that. That infrastructure was not in Sheffield. I bought this building 25 years ago, converted it to a live workspace, accidentally fell into the film location business. As you know, LA is a movie town, hmm. Hollywood, right? Sheffield has a lot of old buildings that are great. And yes, they filmed Full Monty there. And yes, Def Leppard's from there. But no and film and Cop TV There's industry. There's no real film and TV business yeah. there. So factor in, the sun shines here almost every day of the year. We've got world-class driving roads. So if you're a car guy, this is the epicenter of everything that's car related. And it's been that way since just after the war. People have been building hot rods here for 75 years. Yeah. Every the major Mulholland brand, race thing. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah, every major brand has a design studio here. Yeah. So LA is just a creative space where, unlike the landscape of England 40 years ago, people in LA didn't care where you came from, what you sound like, and what you look like, and what your accent is. So are you the epitome of the American dream? I think I have to be. You are. So, you know, that's, How can you not be? That's why I'm 57. I spent 19 years in Sheffield. I've spent 38 years of my life in LA. I became a US citizen five years ago. When I was growing up in Sheffield, I actually never owned a car, never had a driver's license, barely had a job, barely had a bank account, never had my own apartment, lived with my mom and dad until I left. All my adult responsibility, not knowing anyone. You've got to remember, I took a trailways bus from Detroit to LA, arrived at Union Station two miles up the road from here at 6 a.m with about 200 bucks in my pocket. I didn't know anyone. But I had a dream and a vision, and to me, failure was going back to Sheffield. And you started selling fashion at Venice Beach? 
I bummed around for a couple of years, couch surfing the sex, drugs, rock and roll years from 86 to 88, 89, and then I started selling second-hand clothing on the boardwalk in Venice. Yeah. Old Levi's, cowboy, thrift store stuff. Yeah. Venice Beach is still the epicenter of... I was there yesterday. What a cool, edgy place still. Yeah, <laughs> and in the 80s, it was really cool and edgy. Yeah. So I, I started on the boardwalk selling second-hand clothing, formed a wholesale company, moved downtown in 94, uh, built the clothing company up as a, a design and manufacturer, had my own retail store, outfitted everyone from Alice Cooper to Madonna. Along the way, bought a few Porsches, the first one being the car that became 277 yeah. in 1992, 32 years ago. So that was a real dream come true and a personal sense of achievement. Because you've got to remember, 10-year-old me, 15 years earlier, wrote a letter to Porsche saying, hey, I want to design cars for you. They wrote me a letter backwards to the effect, call us when you're older. Ironically, when Tamir Moscovici's film came out in 2012, yeah, they Porsche you. wrote me a second letter. <laughs> and I'm going to show you that letter on the way out. Yeah, yeah. So the moral of the story is find something you love to... The hardest part, I think, for people is finding something they're passionate about and starting. But let, let's a lot of people get sidetracked because they'll say to the buddy, hey, I've got an idea. I want to make candles on the boardwalk in Venice. And the buddy may go, that's a stupid idea. And those people may go, oh, okay, yeah, I'm not going to bother. But if you stand at the line and go, fuck it, I'm going to do it, and you cross over that line and you start, you're already wrong. Well, that's going to be my point, right? So you undersell yourself on the basis of, hey, kind of follow my passion, almost right place, right time. But you made that happen. But you've also done something that entrepreneurs do and are characterized by, which is to take risk. Now, not everybody wants to take risk. Jumping on a plane, living in a different country, uh, seeing if you can make it, only having $200 in your pocket, where most people, most people simply don't have that psyche that appetite for risk because they're too worried about failure you've kind of stuck your fingers up and thought well yeah i may fail i may not but i'm going to enjoy, enjoy what i'm doing and you've kind of gone with it but it's not without that acumen that has allowed that risk taking to make you the success that you are right yeah i think you hit the nail on the head there's a, a little bit of tenacious british bulldog spirit there's a little bit of it has to be better from where uh, than where i came from the grass is greener on the other side mentality Working class environment in Sheffield in the mid 80s was a little bleak. LA looked a little bit better. Hmm. It looked like what I'd seen on TV, you know. And that that's was what it looked like. That was probably the catalyst, right? You know, I, I want to be there. I was into everything we spoke about earlier on American TV, American music, Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue, hmm. you know, Poison. Those bands were bands I was listening to, along with British heavy metal bands. But for some reason, the LA environment just seemed more of what I was into. Plus, it was a, I've been a rebel from an early age. So being here was ultimate freedom. Not being told, cut your hair, get a real job. You can't look like that living under the roof of my house. Okay, well, there's a little bit of anti-establishment bit of rebellion. my family. Yeah. Sure. Hmm. So this whole outlaw thing, I've been a lone wolf since I was a teenager. You know, I went to my first rock show when I was 15 in 1982. I went to Monsters of Rock. That's 42 years ago. I was a 15-year-old. So growing up, I was into middle distance, long distance running. That's a solo individual sport. It's not a team sport. So I was always, in my own mind, a bit of a lone wolf outcast. So coming to America not knowing anyone wasn't actually that intimidating. It didn't phase you, clearly. It didn't really phase me. I mean, worst case scenario, I'd go home. But if I went home, that was failure. So the goal was never to actually go home. Do you still go back sometimes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your mum's still there, right? My mum's still there. My brother and sister are still there. I'm going back for my birthday in July. You know, uh, it took me 14 years to go back. I... I didn't go back until 2001. Yeah. For the first 14 years, I was illegal. I'd overstayed my visa. Ironically, I had a social security number. I was paying tax. I was employing American people, but I didn't leave the country. Everyone came to visit me. All right, so you didn't leave because you wouldn't get back in? I wouldn't get back in. Wow. And I had too much to lose at that point. Yeah, yeah. So I became Hotel California. Everyone came to visit me. I was living in Venice up until 94, moved downtown in 94 to a big loft. Anyway, in 2000, I got a green card through this thing called First Preference, where you have to show you have some artistic talent. Usually actors, writers, musicians, athletes get it. I got it through being a clothing designer, and I was on a green card all the way up to when I became a U.S. citizen in 2019. Hmm. You know, I'd been in the country 32 years at that point. I think you're the epitome, though, of what people, th people look at, you know, however you define success, people look at someone that's successful, and they think it's all been overnight. Uh, you've spent... I mean, by the sounds of it, 40 years becoming an overnight success. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, success is freedom, and freedom is the ability to do whatever you want to do when you want to do it. Yeah. And not answer to someone else when you do it. Yeah, yeah. That's my story. Keep no, on I'm going, man. Keep yeah. on going.